Welcome everyone to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. If you're joining us for the first time, it's a real privilege to have you here and you've joined at a wonderful time because our guest today is uh, General Tim Cross, CBE, retired general of the British Army. Tim, welcome. Morning. Thank you so much, Tony. Great to be with you. It's really great to have you. I wonder if you could take just uh, a few seconds and just give us a little highlight of uh, what's been a, a very interesting and a very noteworthy career. So well over 40 years, man and boy in the military. Um, I served in Northern Ireland in the 1970s as a bomb disposal operator. I then served in the Balkans three times, the first Iraq war, the uh, last Iraq war in 2003 when I served in Baghdad, served in Cyprus with the United Nations, uh, lived in Paris for a couple of years, did four tours in Germany during the Cold War, and then various tours in the UK and elsewhere. Moved house 26 times. Uh, and Christine, my wife, uh, suffered that over, over those 30 odd years um, and uh, had a wonderful career. I, I love, it sounds a bit pathetic really, but I loved every day of it. And Tim, as far as I'm aware, you were the senior British officer in Iraq? Uh, I was the senior British officer in Baghdad, working with the Americans, being in Kuwait and then flew into Baghdad as the statue mm -hmm. came down. From a sort of post-war point of view, I was a senior Brit for a while, yeah. So you've, you've really been around and you've seen a lot and you've done a lot and that's wonderful. And you are, of course, a keen supporter of real marriage and we'll come on to that in a minute. But before we do so, I'm just curious and I'm sure uh, some of our listeners will be curious. What makes uh, a general in the British Army? I was born in 51. I was adopted uh, as a baby by my father. I didn't know that until I joined the army in, when I was 16. Uh, my family dad was a fantastic father. He was a very calm man. He, he was a great gardener, had a big workshop lathe i used to work with him in, in the in the workshop and in the garden he smoked a pipe he was a sort of classic middle class uh, family of the 50s and 60s era really so it was a very calm very peaceful very confident of who i was um and uh and loved and very secure and i think that sort of background solid background for anybody is going to give them you know a way into developing a career those words are so important coming from a good loved cared for background where you learn discipline you learn some practical skills that put you on the path of a worthwhile career and i think that's that's a really valid point we might well touch on again as we go through our conversation together you've obviously led a very uh, worthwhile career in the army while having what some people might call conventional views on marriage i wonder if we could touch maybe for a, a few minutes on how you saw attitudes to marriage change during your time of service in mean, my commission service spanned from 1971 through to 2007. Hmm. So I, what I saw was what was going on in society. The military is, you know, in, in, in a simple sense, re reluctant to follow those changes on a whim, hmm. but nonetheless has to recognize that it represents society, it represents the nation. So in the early seventies, you know, marriage was marriage. Nobody had a conversation, really a debate about anything other than you wanted to get, if you wanted to live with somebody, you got married. Hmm. And most people got married in a church. And you got married before you had children and you raised a family. Now, of course, and I was part of it. I mean, I, I came from what today is called a blended family. I think the big change came with the development of this word partner, where suddenly people stopped wanting to talk about husband and wives. And that was part of a bigger conversation of other issues that were going around at the time. But the word partner is a word, if I'm honest, I just do not like it. Um, it carries with it the sense of, I have a bridge partner, a tennis partner, a business partner. I now have this person who's my partner. But if the circumstances change, if I get bored or I don't think they're playing a good game or I see somebody else that I, I think is much nicer or potentially, you know, I'll be happier with them, then rather like changing my bridge partner or my tennis partner, I just change them. Mm -hmm. like changing my energy provider. I mean, the great motto of the British Army is serve to lead. And marriage was about serving one another being with one another being committed to one another the changes that went on in the 70s and 80s were more about me and my needs and my development but it began to have an effect because marriage was taken very seriously in the military i had to ask permission of my commanding officer to marry my wife christine really and she could have said no and if you got permission and you got married you were then there were certain things followed from that and if you had an affair in your regiment uh, at any level, really, it was treated very seriously. And if a commanding officer or one of the officers had an affair with the wife, for example, of another soldier, they were, they were got rid of. 
they could be court martial because marriage was seen to be absolute glue that held together the ability of the British military to fight and win on a battlefield. Now, with the introduction of partners, that began to change, of course. People said, well, I don't want to get married, but I'm living with Bill or Fred or, or, or uh, you know, Margaret. I want, why can't I live in a house? Why can't I be given a house? And, and that raised a whole raft of issues that, frankly, we took quite a long time to get our minds around because there were serious implications. Apart from anything else, there were financial implications. And I think we're creating, there's a da real danger that we're going to create a military which is just not geared to operational deployments and fighting and, and mm. so on. Now, I don't mm. want to overplay that. There's lots mm. of reasons why we've got you know, uh, brilliant soldiers mm. uh, you know, in the military, as good as soldiers as, as I ever served with and had the pleasure to lead. Mm. Um, but that dynamic is changing and it's part of the changes within society as a whole, which talks about my needs, our needs as a family, yep. as yep. opposed to serve to lead, the idea of duty, the idea of, of um, sacrifice, if you like. Another recent article in the press was about uh, a US Army related article talking about uh, women uh, officers, so women soldiers objecting to uh, sharing showers with men who suddenly have identified as women. Have you experienced any of that in your service? The separation of toilet facilities and showering facilities and so forth in barracks and mostly on operations was quite clear. Um, and worked pretty well. But the idea now that I could identify myself as a woman and therefore use women's facilities does create tensions and not surprisingly. You know, the truth is, would I want my daughter to join a military where suddenly this sort of thing is, is happening? Well, the honest truth is, no, I wouldn't really. Um, and and, and it's, it, like all these discussions, we, one's got to be very careful about being judgmental and sweepingly generalizing, mm. saying this is all terrible stuff. Again, in a military environment, the balance between what is right for me and my desire and what I think I am and what is best for the unit and the military that I'm operating in and what we are there to deliver, which is the ability to win on a battlefield, is you know, not easy, but the latter is more important than my desires. Is your opinion that this is increased or decreased the fighting power? Uh, I think the overall totality of it is, is, uh, is negative rather than positive. Now, again, let's be clear. For individual people to make their own choices, to live their own lives, yep. and in doing so, be comfortable with who they are, um, is very important. You know, do we want an army where there are no homosexuals? No, <laughs> I want people, I want an army that's full of brave people who are committed yep. to delivering what it is they're there to deliver. But the tensions that are being brought about with these conversations mm -hmm. and the tensions that result from having partners, not wives or husbands, mm -hmm. um, and all the other things we're talking about does make it much more difficult. And taken as a whole, I'm, I'm not convinced that we are as agile or as capable of delivering as perhaps we were 20 or 30 years ago. But it's a very fine balance. And, I, and I, I, you know, again, I've, I've got to be careful in being dismissive. The British Army today has, has got great people. And we've seen that in Iraq and Afghanistan in the last mm. decade. Brave people who go out on a fighting patrol, not knowing whether they're going to come back with both legs yeah. or arms, yeah. or they're going to come back in a coffin. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've got to see this in that round, but yeah. we have to be honest and be able to have a sensible conversation about yeah. what does the realities of all of these things, which individually don't look too, you know, bad in inverted commas, but collectively pull together, what is the overall impact on our ability to do the business? Where do you think it's all leading? I mean, is, is there a, a conclusion? From a broader society point of view, I don't think there's any doubt, everybody is a person of faith. They see the world through a prism. For many, that prism is promise that I will be true to myself. Hmm. Well, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, Milosevic, Saddam Hussein, all sorts of hoods we can mention, hmm. presumably were all being true to themselves. Hmm. They're, they're not people that I would want to model my life on. Tension of who I am and my needs and so forth is very hmm. powerful. And my concern is that that's, wi that's what's winning. I, for one, will not allow the so-called woke community to tell me what I can or cannot say or what I can or cannot think. I am perfectly entitled 
to put my views into the public arena. We collectively must not allow ourselves to be pushed aside in these conversations. Mm. Because where we're going, I don't warm too much, is the honest truth. And I'm not saying we need to package everybody into the same way of living back in the 1950s. Because one of my great mantras in life is that all choices carry consequences. If we allow society to make these choices without understanding what those consequences will be, we'll wake up and think, where's this gone wrong? can't imagine anybody shutting you up to be honest tim if you don't want to be shut up um but have you got any advice for other people who might be thinking oh well i'm a bit you know i'm not a general in the british army i haven't quite got that level of confidence but i feel what i feel and i want to make it known but i'm a bit scared have you got any advice for anybody ultimately it's about courage but it's about moral courage more than physical courage they're very different things and moral courage is the ability to stand up and speak out when what we know is happening around us is going badly wrong. And the morally courageous are those who are prepared to stand up and engage in that conversation as opposed to turn away. Now, that could be bullying at school. It can be somebody fiddling the books at work. It can be all sorts of issues where the natural inclination for a lot of people is to walk away and say, well, it's not my problem. Why should I get involved? Mm. Now, that doesn't mean you have to stand up on a soapbox in Hyde Park. Mm. It, it means engaging with your local MP. Let him know what you think. If more people in their local communities engage with their MP or became governors or got into a local party, whatever party that is, whatever, you know, Labour, Conservative, Lib Dem, Welsh Nationalist, SNP, whatever, join the party, influence the thinking, and were part of the selection process for who their local MP was going to be, making sure that that person is, you know, is, is understanding where they're coming from. Governors become a governor of a school, all sorts of things we can do. Engage uh, by writing letters to the media. So when you get these expressions, well, everybody does this, just send a letter saying, actually, everybody doesn't do this. I don't do it. And actually, I don't know anybody else who does. And we're not all called to do the same thing. We're not all called to be generals in the army. And I know it's easy to say that, but you don't have to be loud and aggressive like crusty old generals. Anything else you want to cover, Tim? I genuinely believe that the vast majority of people in this country are actually interested in this. It's a very small, vociferous mm. minority who are driving many of these changes. Mm. And it just reinforces the point that that means the rest of us need to engage and stand up, stand up against it. All I, uh, all I would also add, which we've touched on a couple of times, is we must be kind in this debate. We must not be sweepingly judgmental about what's going on in society. And that balance is not easy. Tim, General Tim Cross, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I want to thank you personally for your service. I would love to have served under you. Um, thank you for your time speaking to us today. And perhaps we'll talk again sometime in the near future. Great. Thank you, Tony. Great to be with you. Take care.